Yes, uh, thanks very much again for the invitation and for this great uh, topic month. So, so I will talk basically about these three topics. And um, so, so the structure will be not that I start easy and become complicated, but I think I will try to start over each time. So with each with each topic, there will be uh, today model tensor categories. I will basically start from from the start and uh, try to start very slow. So apologies if people know stuff. Um, and then I will do the next time quantum groups again. Start very slow and then uh, go to more advanced topics at some point. Um, and then at the fourth, I will I will try to put all these strings a little bit together. Um, and in each of these topics, uh, I think it's going to be an introduction, but at the same time, I think there will be like a little my, my personal perspective, which is maybe not so textbook um, already inside at the, the very beginning. So, so I'm not, of course, giving a textbook talk. There is much better textbooks than me, um, I, but I will try to focus very much on which structures we really have. I mean, and at the same time on, on examples that you really can get your hands on. So I think this mixture between these two things is actually quite good. Um, I have slides. Uh, I like blackboards, but I have slides not to push more information into you, but so that I uh, have many pictures. Um, and also maybe we have more time for, for discussions and questions. So please feel very free to interrupt at any time. I think I've got more than enough time. So please feel free to, to interrupt and ask, also make me spell out some definition or something. And if I really don't like the question you're asking that I just do like this, <laughs> that's, that's uh, this is how we scare, scare your spirits away. So we'll do this with your questions. Yes. Um, so, so let's start. Modular tensor categories. So, ah, yeah, now it works. So the first lecture, as I said, is on modular tensor categories. Also, a little bit topological field theories, and in particular the non-semi-simple setting. So it's very usual to do this all semi-simple, and I sort of want to have it non-semi-simple from the start. Let's first start with representations. I think the first non-trivial example we all want to have in mind is representations of a finite group. And what is this? I mean, it's a group. Have some base fields, and you have some vector space, and a representation of the group on the vector space is a map that assigns to each group element an invertible matrix on this vector space, so linear endomorphism, um, such that the, the one in the group doesn't do anything, and the product of two elements in the group does the product of the matrices. So this is uh, basically you're assigning matrices to group elements, and I'm sure you all know this, but I'm repeating it anyhow. And I write uh, as an abbreviation for this application of a group element turned into a matrix applied to a vector. I just write G dot V. So that's the action. So I imagine this is the group is doing something to the vector space. And uh, most, most groups that like matrix groups like GLN or SLN, so, so uh, determinant one and by N matrices or orthogonal matrices, they come with one obvious representation. But it turned out in the development of group theory that it's very sensible to not just look at one specific present re representation, maybe the one where I get my group from defining or something, but to somehow study systematically all possible representations. And that's, of course, something you all know, but that's something I want to very much emphasize. So, for example, there's groups like A5 and S4 and A4, which you get sort of standard representations from because they are SN, but at the same time, they are symmetry groups of some platonic solid. So you have three dimensional representations, maybe non obvious ones, one that you would maybe not get from the abstract group structure, you know, because they act on this vector space as all matrices that sort of send the platonic solid to itself. And that's a very non trivial way of producing three dimensional representations of these groups. Yes. So uh, let's a little bit try to summarize the theory. So, of course, any group has a one dimensional trivial representation, like we're in mathematics, right? So uh, we we start always with a trivial object. Uh, that's what physicists make fun of us for. Um, so there's a trivial representation. So if we have two, two different representations, what we can do, we can take the direct sum. So we take the direct sum of the vector spaces and we act by block matrices. So that's quite a boring procedure. So conversely, whenever I've given a representation, I immediately want to know how it decomposes into block matrices, right? Simultaneously. I mean, it's all, all matrices assigned to group elements should simultaneously be block matrices. Um, and that, of course, is something that's boring. So this is, uh, I decompose everything. So my representation is called simple. It's the only subspace that I have that is G-stable, so which is fixed by, and fixed by, kept by itself, by all, uh, by all group elements. It's the zero uh, vector space in the whole vector space. A representation is called semi-simple. If everything decomposes into a direct sum of simples, so it can always do that, that's somehow a, 
fancy not notion uh, generalizing diagonalizability, right? A matrix is diagonalizable if I can split it into one dimensional spaces. And here somehow this group action is diagonalizable if I can sort of decompose it simultaneously into block matrices, and then there is no subspaces which are fixed. But that is in the non semi simple cases, not all. We have in decomposables. So those are those are um, those are representations on which the group acts, and they are not simple. So there is an invariant subspace, but still you cannot decompose it into a direct sum of representations. And maybe the, the easiest example for this to have in mind, <clears throat> and it's in some sense we're defining with the example, is let's take the group Z. And let's act the group Z on the vector space R2. So here I have a generator G, and I send the generator G to the matrix 1, 1, 0. What does this mean? But we have a subspace, right? The, the, the E1R is a one dimensional sub representation, cannot decompose, which would here be the same as diagonalize. Right? Here's just one element that's relevant. So this is like the main example of. A non semi simple. So, this I have this E1 and I have a quotient of this R2 by this E1 on which this acts, but, but somehow this doesn't split this, this uh, exact sequence, right? So, that's the main example we have in mind. And then there's this famous theorem that tells us that we don't worry about these things because all representations of a finite group are semi simple if the characteristic of the base field does not divide the group order. So, this example was infinite, that's why it slips the theorem. And finite characteristic, we usually find a little bit exotic in this room, maybe. So that's why we don't care about it. <clears throat> but that's why we usually look at semi simple group representations. So the, and the representations is a, of finite groups together with maps that are compatible with these actions is a category. And, and when I say category, of course, a category has many aspects. For me, a category basically encodes what are the simple objects, what are the indecomposables, and how do they sort of glue together from simples. And what are the projectives? So the projectives are the, the maximal indecomposables. Like you cannot make them larger. Everything, everything you make more splits into a direct sum. So I will not define all of this, but uh, so just to get you a feeling of what for me, if I say a category, then I basically mean this information. Yes. So uh, let's go into very simple examples, which you probably all know. Let's take a cyclic group over the field C. Then what are the one-dimensional representations? I will denote them in the whole four lectures by this. So the one-dimensional representations are one-dimensional vector spaces where this group element acts by some power of the primitive n root of unity. So it's a one-dimensional way how to present this group. I let the group element act by root of unity. And I have n different choices, right? Because for k, I can take n different values. And if I take k equal to 0, then everything acts by 0. It's a one-by-one -one matrix, right? Everything acts by 0. And other choices for k act by other root of unities. So, but now I also have other representations that are sort of appear in nature. So uh, I don't like, like there's a saying, right? Everything, not everything that appears in nature appears in nature, but that's not what I mean. So um, take, the, take the representation that you get from permuting. So I can take Zn and permute N elements. From this, I can make a representation by permuting N basis vectors. So it's a permutation representation. It's an N-dimensional representation where Zn permutes. Let's see how this decomposes. So in a basis that looks like this, right? G, a generator acts like this. So it shifts the first basis vector to the second, the second to the third, and so on. But now let's see. There is an invariant vector, namely 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. If I permute this, it stays fixed. So this is most certainly a trivial subrepresentation. It's the vector 1, 1, 1, 1, and if I permute it, it stays. But then I can also find <clears throat> the orthogonal complement of this. And I cheat if I say orthogonal because Luckily, this preserves the semi Euclidean scalar product. It's a trick that we use often. So I can take the orthogonal product uh, um, complement, and this is going to be this, the n minus one simplex, like this, right? And how does the s, how does the z three act on this? Well, it sends e one to e two, e two to e three, and e three to e one. And um, so somehow this permutation representation n decomposes into the trivial one and then n minus one dimensional one. And in fact, there is a theorem that for um, if, if there's a permutation group acting on a set and the permutation is too transitive, which means I can wish for two elements where they go, um, then this is going to be irreducible. 
this is a very usual way of getting representations of, of large finite groups. But in this case, it's not. This is not too transitive. So this, again, of course, I can just diagonalize this completely, and I get the direct sum over all these one dimensions, right? Each eigenvalue appears one time. And note again here, it's simply just diagonalizing this matrix, because there's one generator, and that's the only thing we care about. Yes. So, and of course, the simplex representation, when you draw it, looks like something we will see in the next talk also. So it's like here E1, here E2, here E3, and then Z3 somehow acts by rotating. So that's the, and of course I can upgrade this to an S3 action, and that's the very interesting S3 representation. So let's now do this in characteristic P, even though we all maybe don't like this, but it's a good way of getting examples. So the cyclic group ZP for simplicity over a field of characteristic P. And then suddenly I have a problem if I want to write down simple representations, because the only simple representation I get is one, because one is the only P through the unity I can have. Even if I go to the algebraic closure, I mean, there is nothing. Uh, there is this trick, you know, there is this trick that X to the P minus one is the same as X minus one to the P. It's non separable right? So there's a P times the eigenvalue one uh, in characteristic P. So, so I have a problem. I only have one simple representation. And now let's look again at this permutation representation that we still have. Uh, here should not be C, of course. But, uh, okay. Um, then again, I have an invariant subspace, one, 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 one. But the complement, there's no orthogonal complement. This doesn't work. Rather, if I substitute G minus one, I can make a little base change. And I actually see that I get this algebra. So this X will have power P equals zero for this reason. So actually what you get is representations of this algebra. So X X by some matrix with the P power zero. And uh, if you look at this, then this is a length P Jordan block. So that means that the, the permutation representation is a, a large Jordan block representation where there is the one dimensional. If I divide it away, there's another one dimensional. If I divide it away, there's another one dimensional and so on. So it's a tower of P one dimensionals glued together non-trivially. That's an indecomposable. Actually, it's the projective. Actually, it's the regular representation. It's the largest one you can have, length like P. Yes, and uh, I was I was asked or suggested that I could give exercises, which we can discuss, I think, in two days. Uh, one, I think, very good exercise I always do with students is uh, just look what is the representations of the polynomial ring in one variable, five dimensionals, and of the polynomial ring with divided out x to the n. So this is boring in some sense, but it's very instructive to like go through all definitions you have and see what they mean in this case. It's actually very instructive, but also very easy. So now, now this is what I want to say about representation theory. So we have a category with simples and decomposables and so on. So now let's introduce more stuff. For example, <clears throat> for G representations, I have a notion of a tensor product. So I can take the tensor product of two vector spaces. And how do I act on such a tensor? Well, I act on the left and on the right. Seems like the most natural thing. And it is. So this is how I can, and I can check uh, all the axioms. This is again a representation. And then I have many relations to, to V and W by itself. There's maps inside and so on. And the same I can do. Oh, and there is a, and this is what we call a tensor category. So it's a category with a good tensor product. And there is an axiomatic definition, of course, I will not put it, but that's what it is. Um, so, for example, if we take the one where the generator G acts by, by the Q to the K and one where it's act by Q to the L, then this is again a one dimensional vector space. And how does G act? Well, it acts here by this scalar, here by this scalar, so it acts all together by this scalar. So you see immediately that you get a group law here, right? This is basically just the, the simple object just from the group that, that end. But if I take, for example, the permutation times the permutation representations, I have all combinations of I and J. And now if I start permuting them cyclically, then I get the following orbits. Okay. Like when I permute simultaneously, or when they are off by one, and so on. So permutation times permutation decomposes into P copies of permutation, just to get examples. Right? Now, another thing we can do is, if suppose we have a Lie algebra, we can now do the same thing. And if you don't know what a Lie algebra is, then maybe. Uh, so the infinitesimal version of an algebra, and that's all for a group, and that's more than you want to know. Um, but let's suppose you know what a Lie algebra about is. Um, then, uh, then I can add also the tensor product of this Leibniz rule, so like a derivation, first on this side, then on this side. And now it's again interesting to decompose tensor products. So for example, SL2, which is the Lie algebra of 
traceless two by two matrices. They act on the two dimensional vector space, which we call V one half. So this is C2 just acting, well, there are matrices. So there is one obvious representation. You act like the matrix you are. Um, so it acts on this two dimensional matrix. Um, all together, if you analyze this Lie algebra, which representation it has, it has is semi simple and it has simple modules V lambda for each half integer lambda, uh, half natural number lambda, dimension two lambda plus one. So for lambda equals to zero, that's the one dimensional trivial representation. For lambda equals to one half, that's this two dimensional representation, and so on and so on. So there is this series of representations, and I'm sure most of you very well know that, but I want to say it nevertheless. And let's now try to explicitly construct what the tensor product of this with itself is. So here there is two basis vectors, and the matrices just act as matrices. Here there is two basis vectors, and the matrices act. But now, if I act with a matrix here plus here, what happens? So for example, again, I have this element here, which will be invariant, like in the previous example. First basis vector times second, and second times first. Because for example, if I act with the upper triangular matrix, here I will get zero, but here I will get E1. And here the same, here I will get E1 plus, and here I'll get zero. So there's E1, 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 they cancel, finished. And you do this for all matrices and you see after two lines that this is fixed. And if you go on this side, you find this three vectors that behave like the like V1, like the three-dimensional representation. So where upper triangular matrices bring you up here and lower bring you here. And uh, you can check that this is a basis and that this splits as representations. This is the typical example I think you all have known, but I want to say. And this is significant in, in several places in physics, for example, spin addition. So this is a spin half particle and you see how it decomposes into spin zero and spin one possibilities. It's like checking all the possibilities, including how the symmetry group acts. So, yes, so this is now tensor product. But now let's go to the first a little bit, maybe non-trivial case. Um, now we can try to do this in general, and I will not do the theory because we will not need it, but let's nevertheless say um, I can try to make representations of an algebra into a tensor category. I need some rule how an element from the algebra becomes two elements of the algebra, so I know how to act on the left and on the right. So this is actually the whole, the whole idea of a Hopper algebra. So it's like the two examples before, but I have some rule if I want to act with little h, then I get some H1 and H2, and I act with H1 on the first tensor factor, with H2 on the second, and that's it. So it's a, it's a rule how to act on tensor products. And let's try again this weird algebra we had in characteristic P here. Let's try this algebra with this rule. So again, like a V algebra. So X should act on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side with a plus in between. Let's check what happens if X to the P, which we want to divide out, acts on V tensor W. Well, the first x, x acts here plus here. The second x acts here plus here, and so on. So you get this typical binomial law, right? And it's just, uh, um, yeah, you could, you could say, you could say I, I, I write first this, and then take the p's power, right? And I mean, this is just all the combinations you can have. It's like this. So for example, if this is one, then it's just x1, x0, and x0, x1. And the binomial coefficient counts how often I how often, how often I get the combination. So I mean this formula would be true for, for Lie algebra, right? Lie algebra in one generator, very boring Lie algebra. But let's now see whether we can set the pth power to zero. But you see here appearing lower powers. So that would imply that all of the lower powers act by zero. So the take home message, which is boring, but it's somehow also disappointing is you can never set a p derivative to zero because that crushes with a, yes, please. Uh, why? I mean, you have zero on p factorials. But we're not yet in characteristic p. Oh, you're not. No, no. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. This, this will be the next one. So, so in, a, in a usual field, sorry, in a usual field, you cannot do this because it crashes with a product rule. Right? If you set a p derivative to zero, then you would have to set all lower derivatives also to zero. That's just a fact. You cannot do this. But uh, then the punchline that uh, Jeff already know very well that will happen, and he thought I already made it, uh, is if I'm in characteristic p, then these binomial coefficients usually disappear because here's a p. 
So they're usually zero, um, except for the first and the last, of course. So they survive. So, uh, so in characteristic P, this is just one tensor P. It's again the same formula as before, right? X to the P plus X to the P tensor one. You can check this for the square, right? It's very easy. It's like one tensor X plus X tensor one, and you square it. And then, and then like the, the, the mixed terms appear two times, and these two is zero. So that's what happens. So, so in this case, it works. So in characteristic P, a P derivative is again a derivative by the product rule, and I can set it zero. And this particular example leads to what is called P restricted Lie algebras in characteristic P. So we might all find this very exotic, and in fact, probably I also do, but it's the, the first time where we see this sort of behavior. And we will see it in other contexts later that are maybe more interesting to us. Probably you still don't know that. I'm curious when is the point when suddenly um, question marks and faces. Uh, yes, and there is, of course, nice exercises on this, elementary exercises. You can uh, co compute some tensor products, which we stated. There is a group S3 acting on, on simple modules. You can compute those tensor products. From this, you can compute tensor products of the indecomposables, which we found in the last exercise. Um, and it's also a good opportunity to recall, if you don't already know this, uh, um, character tables. So groups have these very nice character tables where you write down the trace of these matrices assigned to every group element. And then this will only depend on the conjugacy class. And you write large tables for each simple representation, the value of the character. And you can use this to decompose representations, to compute tensor products, and so on. It's a very, very nice theory. Not right for now, but uh, so this is something one can recall. Maybe the exercises, if you're interested in, we can work on this a little bit more. It's very beautiful for groups. Anyway, so this was the tensor product. Let's now add more structure. So for every G representations, we have a G linear map that switches V tensor W to W tensor V. Then you just send V tensor W to W tensor V. And the point is that if you remember how I acted on here with G and G, because G and G is symmetric, it's the same as acting here with G and G. So because this assignment of acting with G on the left and G on the right is a symmetric assignment, I can just switch tensor factors, and that is a G linear map. This is compatible with the G action, right? And, and this is very nice. Uh, this, and this map, of course, fulfills the so-called young baxter relation. So if I switch these two, and then I switch these two, and then D, this is equal to the other way around. So, so this re representations of a group G gives you an example of a braided tensor categories. So braided meaning I have a map that switches VW to WV. Or if you want, the tensor product is commutative. It's a commutative product. But you have to specify in which way you have to get the map. Um, and also there is dualities and twists. Um, I will not go into this, but it's important. And this example is in some sense very boring because if I switch and I switch again, I am ending up at the same identity map. Um, but there's other examples where this is not so easy. So if I switch, I maybe get some factors or I get maybe some even much more crazy. So if I switch and switch back, of course, I have a map again to V tensor W, but this map needs not to be trivial. Because in a category now, right, you have structure. It's not just being commutative. It's having a map that makes it commutative. And this map can be sort of arbitrarily complicated. And, and these examples that are, that are non-symmetric braidings uh, give you, of course, as you can already see from this picture, suggested give you not invariance and stuff like that. So this is very interesting from this perspective. And maybe at the end, we'll see a little bit of this. So now we want cases where this braiding is not so boring, where the braiding is not symmetric. And one very easy way is to take our category that we have from the start and put, I mean, we can put the trivial braiding, but we also can put an alternative braiding. We can do this. We can just put a Q factor in front. So if I switch this simple object and this simple object where the generator G X by Q to the K and Q to the L, I put this prefactor, right? You can just do this. Careful. If the group order is even, then you have to be a little bit careful with that because it's uh, you have to you have choices here, and these choices cause a uh, non-trivial associativity constraint. So I mean, of course, I could take a different factor, but I won't do for later reasons. But so this factor gives a problem if the root of unity has an even order. If it has an odd order, it's not a problem because 
well, it's two is invertible modulo n. So I want to do this like this because then if I break two times, what I get is exactly q to the k plus n, right? The double braiding is q to the k plus n. And uh, this means if q is an n through the unity, this means precisely that the only object that has a trivial double braiding with all objects is the identity, the only simple object. And that is, so it's not just non-trivially braided, it's sort of maximally non-trivially braided because this condition here holds. And for this, I need this one half. Um, so I can produce, of course, greater tensor categories, but they will not have this non-degeneracy condition in the even case if I don't put this one half. So and and so this, what we just had is a first example of what's called a modular tensor category. So it's a tensor category with the braiding, and it has also twists and dualities, and the double braiding is maximally non-trivial. So uh, I summarized the axioms once again. Uh, maybe just to have it in the slides for if you want to look up it later. Um, and there's in principle, it's just all I said, but there's there's different equivalent non-degeneracy conditions, which in the semi-simple case, I think many of you know, but uh, but in the non-semi-simple case, they are all a little bit tr tricky and we will get to them later. So the, 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 the definition I told you was the only object with trivial double braiding for all other objects is the identity the trivial object or, or sums of it. But there's also another condition which says that if I compute the drill field center of this category, which we'll introduce later, um, which is like a, a braided category, braided tensor category, this is just equivalent of two copies of C. And a third equivalent condition is that the co end, which I will also introduce later, um, which is a Hopf algebra in the category, it has a pairing by the Hopf link, and this is non degenerate pairing. So those are sort of the three different directions, with it, but they all coincide. And if you know modular tensor categories, you know for each of them expressions, which are like more elementary, because you can just work on matrices indices by simple objects, like this S matrix is invertible or something like that. But if you go non semi simple, you have to use conditions like this. But there is papers by Shimizu and so on that show that all of these are equivalent and you can work with them. So that's how we work with modular tensor categories. Uh, let's now go into examples. So, so, so questions so far. Am I too fast or too slow? For any abelian group, I can define a category, which is as a category very boring. It's A graded vector spaces, which means the simple objects are just Ka decorated by an element A from this group. So you have a bunch of simple objects in this by the group. The tensor product is just the group law. And the dual object is just the group inverse. It's semi-simple in every characteristic, by the way. So it's semi-simple, uh, all, all objects are invertible and so on. Now I need to put all the structure that I have. I need an associator, which means I need a map that gives sensitivity. So Ka tensor Kb tensor Kc to this other bracketing. Now, if I compute this object by this rule, it's literally Kabc. It's a one-dimensional vector space decorated by ABC. Here also, it's a one-dimensional vector space decorated by, K, by ABC. Um, the only morphisms I have are numbers, so multiples of the identity. So I put some number depending on ABC. Also, the braiding is going to be like before, some factor, just depending on A and B. And then there will be correlations and so on, and a twist that will again just depend on A. And so a well-posed question is now, which pairs of number collections, sigma and omega, I need to make this into a braided tensor category or to a modular tensor category? And there's a theory like that uh, that's called abelian three cross cycles by McLean. So um, you can classify them up to equivalence, and they are classified by quadratic forms. And so that means that for every abelian group and a quadratic form, I get such a such a braided tensor category. Let me quickly say how that goes. So quadratic form means uh, it's a map from A to this such that QA, QB over QAB is bimultiplicative. That's some form A cross A to K. Oops. And then the braiding is chosen in a way, and if to prove that you can do this, that the double braiding is this BAB. And the self braiding is this Q. And omega somehow, yeah. 
represents the fact that sigma is not multiplicative. So the typical thing you would do is uh, you have a quadratic form, and this is this um, associated by multiplicative form, and this gives you the double gradient. So this is a nice by multiplicative map. And then you want to somehow take the square root. You want to choose a braiding with this double braiding because experience somehow tells you the double braiding is an invariant of the category, but the single braiding not because you can rescale all your morphism spaces. You can put some numbers. So I can put a number here, the inverse number here, it doesn't change the double braiding. So somehow this is a rather, rather arbitrary thing here. But if an, in an even group, I will not manage to do this to get the square root again multiplicative. And uh, Omega is a three co cycle that somehow measures this. So omega is zero or one if this is a p multiplicative map and otherwise not. And this is, of course, again, what we saw in our example before. So in our example before, maybe I should put this. So in our example before, example Zn, uh, we had q of a is. Q to the A square and B of A, B. I have to think for a second. Yes, it's like this. And the braiding you want to have is now Q to the A, B half. And here there's a half like this. So this is the example that we had before. I think this is a very good example. And you see again, this is a very nice B multiplicative map from ZN, ZN to ZN. ZN, ZN to uh, numbers and this is also a well post quadratic form because if you switch here if you send a to a plus n then uh, because you have two n inside it doesn't it doesn't have a problem it's well defined so this is well defined modulo n but this here is not well defined modulo n so here you have to make choices so this is the bad expression so this you cannot you cannot cure <clears throat> and if you have a group that n where n is even, then, then this is not going to be multiplicative, and the omega will be a three cos cycle measure. Yeah, please. So I, I don't understand why from QA you have to divide by two because they... uh, yes, I mean we can uh, of course take a different few, right? So you can if you if you don't divide by uh, so so I, I want to divide by two so that this has a chance of being non-degenerate. If I, if, I, if I don't divide by two, I have a two here. I can do this, right? No problem. I can also change the cube, but uh, let's, let's do it your way. So uh, I can do it like this. Maybe, uh, maybe my, my question is more basic than that. When you have um, a linear form, a uh, multiplicative yeah. linear form, how do you define the quadratic form? It's, there are several choices. This is not, uh, it's just one direction. Okay. No, no, you cannot. You cannot. Somehow you want to you want to find a square root. Okay. Like there is a theorem of quadratic forms, for example, on characteristic P, many people need it for several purposes. And the point is it's like not really one to one, it's more like two to one. So there is more quadratic forms for one bilinear form. And the quadratic form somehow has, has more, more intrinsic properties and problems, which you don't see on there. So here, if you if you if you just take the double, then then this will simply not be non-degenerate. Because if right, so if you take uh, n Zn. And you take n half for a, then this will be the kernel of this. Right? Okay. Um, then there is another question, uh, another example that appears uh, frequently. So if you have an abelian group, then you can define a modular tensor category, which is consists of g representations, which are also g graded, such that if you act with g on the eighth component, it just conjugates the component. That is a well post category. You could just write this down. So it's two, two, two structures. And then you can work out what the simple objects are. And this is not hard. This is actually a nice little exercise. Um, they are parameterized by a conjugacy class. I mean, obviously, there will be a conjugacy class, which is the grade that appears. And then the question is, how can you still act? And it's, a, it's a, an action of the centralizer of H. So everything that does not change the grade, there is some representation of the group sent H. And these two things together give you the category. And it's semi-simple exactly if the representations of G, to be more precise, the centralizers are semi-simple. And the braiding now is had a very cute form because if I braid G and H graded elements, somehow this loses the H and acts with the H on, on the other element. 
So Jörg Sommerholzer always told me it's two persons, one passes the other, and while he's passing, he's kicking him. Uh, so he, he loses his G and uh, he kicks, kicks the guy while he's passing him. So, uh, so because you have both structures, this is G graded, so it knows which G to lose, and this is a G representation, so I can act with G. So somehow by construction, it's braided. I have to build the braiding in. And then, um, for example, if you look what the symmetric group S3 has, you can have the trivial grading, and then there is the three representations of S3, or you can have the conjugacy class one, two, then there is just the centralizer is just Z2. You have two representations of the centralizer, or one, two, three, you have three representations. So these are all the modules. And you can check in courtesy two or three. This is not semi simple, but I think it's a very nice example of a non semi simple modular tensor category. So I use this in some articles, just as an example. Um, yes. And so this construction that I now showed you again for groups works in general, but this will be due later. Okay. So another example that was in my talk was already, suppose you have a finite dimensional semi-simple Lie algebra, then you can define the quantum group. So we'll Hi, I have a Please. Like, could you go, go back to the previous slide? I'm trying to, so what does the, yeah. So I'm trying to think of, so you, I'm trying to understand better what the simple objects are because I, I feel like I've seen this often and I've never really understood what this is. So um, so you, you basically, I'm, I'm a bit confused. I guess I'm a bit confused so can you like can maybe maybe write out an example of a simple object because I'm 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 kind of struggling and I'm not sure I'm really doing well and trying to ask the question I'm trying to understand what like maybe one of the maybe one of the, like the ones you have over the the sure. non yeah. I can do that um what is the yeah I think it helps to think from the classificatory side so so the construction had little tweaks but not very really difficult ones but but so yeah. from the from the other side it's completely clear so. So you have, if you have, suppose I have one element V in degree G. Now I can act with the entire group on this. So I most certainly will get elements in all conjugated degrees. That's a conjugacy class. Sure. And you can, you can believe me if there's some other conjugacy class, then I can direct some decomposition. Like I can just, they don't talk to each other. So now there is still the centralizer. What does the centralizer of G do? It acts on this and keeps in the same degree. So it will maybe send VG to some other VG. Mm. So, so somehow here you have, a, and then of course by conjugation, you have the same blob here and here and here. So that's how this representation looks like. So, I see, thank so you. This, so this representation, I would say, so pick, pick a representative, that makes it easier. You have to pick representatives to construct those. So, so this representation um, basically has the following, let's say it has the following properties. It decomposes into ve vector spaces V, G prime for each conjugate and an element H that happens to be in the centralizer of G acts on the specific choice VG as this representation says. I see. And now, then you somehow continue this to the other conjugates and see that this is well defined. You have to choose coset representatives. So if you reconstruct it, you have to choose the representatives of the coset sent G and G. And this is a little bit messy, but not. I see. Difficult. Now, maybe this is how would something is not in the centralizer then? Is there how how would you find the formula for how something not in the centralizer? Oh, exactly. Uh, if you really want to know that, and it's good to bug me for that. So if you really want to know how an, an arbitrary element acts, um, you have to choose. A coset decomposition. So you take G and, and decompose it into some coset representatives. I see. Okay. And then the GI literally act by sending sending VG to VG prime, sort of with the identity. So that's like your identification you have. And the other element is in the centralizer, so you know how it acts. Perfect. You decompose every element in centralized element and like your standard conjugator. Thank you. Yes, that's uh, so basically if you just do the representation theoretic side, um, it's an induced representation, but it's somehow an induced representation where you drag the grading along. So, so yeah, very good. Thank you. Okay. So, so this is, yeah, 
one class of examples you can get. And we will generalize this story. So another class of examples um, we already had, and we will have much more next lecture, um, is the quantum group. So I just want to have them here for completeness already. Um, so if, if G is a finite dimensional semi-simple Lie algebra, then we have representations of the Lie algebra. But now you can deform it by some Q. You can fiddle in some Q. Um, so it gets deformed, and you get a Hopf algebra uh, over the field of rational functions in Q. So this is a formal parameter. And what you get is an infinite semi-simple braided tensor category. So it looks as an abelian category, like rep G. So it has the same symbols, the same tensor product rules, and so on. But in all your constraints, in your associator, in your braiding, and so on, it, you fiddle a Q. So, so in particular, uh, it's it's up to the fact that it's infinite. It's it's modular. Like there is uh, the braiding is highly non-trivial, and uh, you can use it to construct very interesting knot invariants like a Jones polynomial and so on. And there was a Fields medal for this, if you know. Um, and Trinfeld's original motivation, to which we come much closer in the last uh, lecture, is that uh, there's a certain system of differential equations. So here for SL two, so those are differential equations in n variables, and uh, and they have a certain they have a certain so the, the, this has a, a space of solutions, and and if you if you sort of analytically continue around one solution, you again get a solution, but it's maybe not the same one, and that's what the non-trivial braiding does. And then you have preferred places of of solutions in each singularity, but if you are in one singularity, you take a, the standard solution, you expand it in the other singularity, it's a non-trivial element, a non-trivial combination of the two solutions. So somehow you have this, this way of, you know, have here preferred basis of solutions, here preferred basis, but re-expanding it in the other singularity sort of does something non-trivial to the vector space. And, and, and somehow Drinfeld constructed the quantum groups in a way that this exactly matches this. So there's really this analytical picture behind, which we will study much later. Um, and then there's again this non-semi-simplicity going on. So if Q is an L root of unity, then I can again look at this. So I can specialize this to a value. This uh, requires some choices. Um, two forms, um, which we often study. One will get a big center, and one will get a small Hopf algebra inside, sub, sub Hopf algebra. And this finite dimensional quotient or sub Hopf algebra that you get is called a small quantum group. And we will work with this much more tomorrow. Um, and its representations give now a finite, non semi simple braid tensor category, which is really modular. And um, <coughs> the original motivation by Lustig, so this was not so much later, was basically he was working on, on the representations of Lie groups in characteristic P, and he was noticing that, uh, that, so he wants to have some of these effects in characteristic zero. Then, in fact, that's all that is. So the representation theory of this guy will look very much like representations of the Lie algebra in characteristic L. So in particular, if your weights get larger than L, things become messy. That's basically what happens. And again, if, uh, if the L is divisible by two and three, you have to be careful with the statement because you have to fiddle in associators. And I wanna show you how I would look at the category of this quantum group now. I'm not gonna define the quantum group so much. We'll do this tomorrow. But I wanna directly construct the category um, and, and also see that this is actually no problem to include, which what we know now, um, and, and get a feeling of this category sort of purely from the category perspective. Let's try if we can get this to work. Uh, so please, please. Just a question. So in the previous slide, <laughs> the base field for the Lie algebra was uh, C or here, here in the last one. Which one? In the last one, uh, so the quantum group is dependent over Q, uh, Q, Q, but. Q over R over C. Oh, so, so sorry, over C, complex C algebra. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm just writing Q here because in algebraic uh, geometry stuff, like we imagine this is the field of rational functions and you can write Q. You could also write C of Q. It's just less information. I mean, information that's even rational numbers and rational functions. Um, but but yes, you could put uh, you could put uh, C here. And here it's most certainly over C. It's, and the Lie algebra is also over C. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so so let's try let's try to get to this category without telling you what a quantum group is. So that's maybe my goal for, for today. Um, so what are the goals? So so what we need is ways how to build tensor categories and braided tensor categories from smaller tensor categories. So we need ways to make it more complicated. 
So um, one thing that we can always do, and this is a nice game, is in a tensor category, there's a notion of an algebra. I hope this is clear how this goes, right? I mean, you simply write down the axioms using tensor products and morphisms. If not, then please interrupt me. I can write that. So I know how the algebra looks like. It's an opt, it's an it's a, it's an in a monetary, completely abstract category. I can write down what an algebra is. It's an object A in the category and a morphism from A tensor A to A, such that blah 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 blah. Right? I mean, it, it's you just simply write down the axioms in this category. But you need a tensor because you need to have A tensor A. So it's a tensor category. Then there's a Hopf algebra if you have a braided tensor category. And this requires more explanation. So, so what is a Hopf algebra again, roughly? Well, it's an algebra. And there's some more, of course, structures, but the, the, and some map like this, which says how to act on tensor products. Like, for example, this x goes to one tensor x plus x tensor one for the Lie algebra, right? So, so, so somehow I need these two structures. I need the algebra structure so I know how to speak about representations, and I need this. This is called a co-algebra structure to know how to how to act on on tensor products of, of representations, and um, and these have to be compatible. And how do they have to be compatible? Well, they have to be compatible. If I act, so if um, if I have some V and some W, and I act with the first H, then I need to uh, now use graphic notation. I need to split this into two with this map, and then act with this here and with this here. So this should be maybe the action. So I should, I should write this down more structured, I'm sorry. So in the category, I have an algebra and a module. And now I have a product rule. And this is how I, how I now wanna act on my, so, so V tensor W becomes a representation. This is the same that, that uh, we had over C. But now the rule that we have is we want to have that this is again a representation. So this means if I act with H1, I act here and here, and now I have a second H and I act like here and here, this should be the same as if I multiply them in the algebra and then do the same game and if you try to write down this as a as a as a uh, um, condition on on how the product and this co-product are compatible, then what this means is, if you have like this, and you multiply these, it should be the same as if you first multiply them, and then use the co-product. So this is the condition that I still have an action on the tensor product that splitting up the first age and splitting up the second age is the same as multiplying them and splitting them up together. But here you see you need a braiding. That's why we need a braided tensor category. So the definition of a Hopf algebra intrinsically uses that you're in a braided tensor category. Um, and you can a little bit imagine this like, this has to do with the following fact, an algebra you have in every category, but now you want to have an algebra structure on the tensor product of the algebra with itself. And that's what we are praying for. So if you analyze what you're actually doing when you say the product of two algebras is again an algebra, then you're using exactly this multiplication. So the problem is that there's no product of algebras in an arbitrary tensor category. There's only a product of algebras in a, in a very tensor category. <clears throat> but nevertheless, so suppose we are in the setting, then we can do this. We have. If you have an algebra, then we can look at representations of this algebra inside our given category. And if I have a Hopf algebra, I can look at representations of this Hopf algebra inside my braided tensor category. And this gives me again a category, this gives me again a tensor category. So this is a very important way of 
producing new tensor categories from old tensor categories. Um, another construction that you want to do is suppose you have a tensor category. Now we can define the drill field center. So what this is is now a braided tensor category. So by force. Namely, what we do is we take pairs of objects in C and what is called a half braiding. So this is a functor, sigma x. So I can apply to every object y, and it's a map x comma y from x tensor y to y tensor x. So it's a categorification of the concept of a center. So what is the, cent the center of an algebra? The center of an algebra is elements that commute with everything. And here it's representations that commute with everything, but commute with everything means I have a map doing that. So I need to come with all these maps. And there are several choices, of course. So, so this I can just do. I mean, I can define this category of, of objects and half braidings that, that tell me how to commute with everything. And this will be a braided tensor category, sort of by definition. And it's also gonna be a, a, actually a modular tensor category. And we've actually seen an example of this because this GG Jeta Drenfeld modules that we have are exactly the example of this for representations of G. So if I take representations of a group G, then, or G graded vector spaces, maybe even better, let's take G graded vector spaces, then this is not, well, let's take G graded vector spaces. This is a tensor category, right? Because as we had, we can, Tensor this like this. So one dimensional in degree G times one dimensional degree H is one dimensional degree GH, but it's not braided because KG tensor KH is not even isomorphic to KH tensor KG, right? Because the group is maybe not a million. Take the Drimsel center, and then I only take those representations that have a chance of being commutative. What are those? Well, those are graded by conjugacy classes, right? If you, if you have not simple objects, but large objects which contain all conjugates of G, then you have a chance of doing that. So those are sort of the objects in the center. They are not simple KGs, but they are sums over all conjugacies. Those have a chance of being in the center. And now I have to tell you how they commute. And that's what I need the action of the centralizer for. So how this map exactly looks like. So then this is what I get. So the example before we saw is exactly an example of a, of a uh, field center. And there is also a related construction. Um, so suppose I have a modular tensor category and inside I have a tensor category. And I have a projection, a modular projection in both, both, both directions. Um, then I can define a so-called relative field center. So I can take the field center so those are all elements that uh, all objects that sort of have a chance of commuting with objects in C. But but I somehow I already have for 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 the C for for this um, object in the smaller category I already have a braiding given. So I want that the braiding on this part could take the full Drinsfeld center, so all objects with all possible half braidings. But for some objects I require that they are a braiding I'm given already. So this is what's called a relative Drinsfeld center. And this is the, the, the main, some of the main constructions that you can have to get from tensor categories into tensor categories. And um, let's try how this looks in an example. And, and maybe it's the time that we should be much more slow. Sorry, which, uh, which objects, so how, how does the compatibility work exactly? Like what, which objects is it, which objects are the, is the half brain constrained and what it can be? With Cause... constraint, the half braiding with with uh, with elements. There's a subcategory C, and the half braiding with elements in C is just. Oh, sorry, I can't, I forgot which I was getting confused about which arrows go where. Sorry, I thought the arrows were first. Thank you. So it's a big non-braided yeah. category and a small braided right, category. Okay. Now I see this now. Thank and you like double. You you make a, a center for the big category, but for the small category, you don't have to do this. So you somehow don't do it. Right, this makes sense. Okay, thank you. Sorry. So let's now let's now some more questions. So we have time. That's not the problem. But I'm still trying. I think I'm still too fast. But uh, so 
So now let's piece by piece construct the tensor category. And maybe we should be more slow on this. I will also raise the blackboard. So let's take again this modular tensor category that we all saw and maybe liked by now. So it's representations of Zn. I could also imagine it by, by uh, graded vector spaces by Zn hat, where Zn hat are, are group homomorphisms from Zn to K. So the objects here were C, Q to the K. Remember, this is generated by a group element G. And C to the K is the one-dimensional vector space where G acts by Q to the K, right? I think that's fine. If not, then now is the time to interrupt because now we go slower on an example. So, so this has a braiding, as I said, as I said, C, Q to the I and C, Q to the J, which is just C, Q to the I plus J. Let's write this down explicitly. Why not? Slides tend to be so weak. So this is the product rule. And how is the braiding? It was on several slides before, but it doesn't hurt to write it again. So I use Q to the IJ half here. And as I said, when you're worried about the half, then uh, let's for a moment go to odd n, but it's still necessary. We can do the same for uh, the right cosine. We can do the same for even n. So this is now our braiding. So take inside now the algebra that we maybe also love, or maybe not yet. So x to the L for some L. I don't specify L yet. We want to find the right L now. So with x should be like a Lie algebra element. I mean, let's not ask too much, right? We know how Lie algebra elements look like. So now, but this comes later, sorry. This is an algebra. And we have to say in which degree x is. So I say x is in degree q squared. That's conventional. So this square is really conventional. We could take uh, other elements here. So this is important for getting a modular tensor category. But this is really conventional. This is because uh, roots tend to have lengths too. Could also skate something else. But nevertheless, let's do it like that. So x is in this um, degree. Are you free to get x in any degree? Yes, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Thanks for the question. That's exactly what I say. So this is somehow not a, not. If you if you lose this, then you start to be non-degenerate. You, you stop to be non-degenerate because you want the double braiding to be q to the ij. But here you can really choose in some very high degree. Then then l will be different. I mean, it just the l will depend on what I choose here. So I can choose. That's the point. I can choose any. And it doesn't have to be an element, right? So in, in principle, I can choose an object in a braided tensor category. But here I choose a one-dimensional object. So in fact, I choose an element, right? Um, now, now let's look. So what we said is, let's look at how do representations of this algebra inside the category look like? So elements in the category are graded vector spaces. They're graded by the uh, sums of these guys here. So I draw them. I draw this graded vector spaces like circles. Right, it's here it's the q to the zero part, q to the maybe two, q to the four, q to the six, but I could also put the odd ones, right? But somehow these are these are the degrees. So an arbitrary object in our category C would be here's some vector space, here's some vector space, here's some vector spaces, and so on. But now I want modules over this algebra B. So I have an, an, an additional action of some endomorphism X, and the property says X should be in degree two. So X should shift the degree by two. So what this category explicitly is, is write up G graded vector space, it's a circle, and with some linear endomorphism that sort of has the right source and target. So it, it's a map from here to here, a map from here to here, a map from here to here, and so on. That's what X does. And of course, we can think of very simple representations of this. I mean, the simplest thing we can do is just let X by zero. I mean, we can just take an element like this, and that x act by zero, that's a perfect representation. And in fact, those are the simple representations in this category, the algebra, right? I mean, for a reductive, for a middle algebra. So, so there is actually, it's the same object as before, but now I can start to build in decomposables because of course I can also take this four dimensional graded vector space where x acts like this. This is now a four dimensional guy. It has 
this as a one-dimensional sub-representation because here x is trivial. If I divide this out, it's a three-dimensional. I can divide this out and so on. So it's a, it's a tower, literally, in a, on a circle. It's a tower of four simple representations of this algebra inside here, glued together to an indecomposable. And this goes up to length L because I want X to the L to be zero. Is that category understood? Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> I guess so, I'm, I'm still trying to get, uh, yes, yeah. trying to get right here. So I'm trying to figure out how, I guess, how this, first off, how this, I guess I have two questions. First off, how is this algebra object exactly an, like an object inside the category? I'm kind of like, I'm think, X, thinking of X as a vector and like this piece is in, but also like thinking about this like as a formal generator is kind of. It is, it is a good question. Let's maybe answer this first. So what do I mean? C of X as a vector space is the span the one dimensional span by one in the algebra plus the one dimensional span by x plus the one dimensional span by x squared. And it goes on until x to the l minus one. And this is, of course, in degree q to the zero. This is in degree two to the q. But then the product of x with itself, by the product being compatible with the grading, has to be in degree q to the four and so on. Each plot, it's basically everything graded. I see. And there's some grading running around, and X has some degree, and then this algebra is some algebra. So it's still an algebra. It's still an honest algebra. It's not something fancy. It's an algebra, but it has more structure. I see. And then, so this, the other thing is that basically the point is that with these representations, then we're basically saying we're going to have X basically be act non trivially, and then at some point we're going to say it acts trivially. Is yes. that the, yes. Okay, cool. Yes, yes. So it's basically representations of this, and that's why it's a good exercise to do this before, uh, representations of this truncated polynomial ring, but just you do everything graded. And that's why the, the, the answer is basically the same. It's just you have to specify in which degree your, your, uh, your vector spaces live. I but see. Basically, it's a graded version of representations of this guy. So at this point, it's very boring. Does it have to start at CQ minus two or can it start? No, this is an accident. It can start anywhere and go anywhere. Okay, thank you. This cannot be too long because X to the other is the X. Sure. And of course, there can be several dimensions here, but but you can always decompose it into like this. This is easy to see. You Thank start you. with something and see what the action is, and then you take this away. And so, every, so everything is like one expects. Especially, of course, the, the projectives are uh, length L, right? It's the regular representation of this algebra starting in some degree. So this is a this is a nice but pretty boring category. But now, now we want to make this a tensor category. And for this, we have to know how X, X acts on tensor products. So that's the next step. Sorry. Please, please, please. Is, still I have fun. is there a relation between N and L? Yes, there is. There is actually a relation between N, L, and which degree we picked. Okay. And that so will come on the next slide. Like the N determines sort of how many. Yes, yes. But I mean, at this point, there is no relation, right? Because at this point, I can take any N and in any N, I can pick any degree and any L. So this category works for every choice, but maybe the right answer to your question. Draw sort of implicitly have N featuring somehow in it. I mean, N is, N is the length of the circle. Yeah, so, okay, okay. So and X is the, below, below, N is minus. the length of the highest power. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No, no, very good for thanks for this is these sort of things that start to get uh, I want to think about them when we do examples it's not just putting the example but uh, I, I'm, I'm happy that you start sort of working in your mind with the example and not just accepting it so so at this point x l and, uh, and n in this convention are completely independent but of course now this will not be anymore um yes so this is this category of basically representations of some track polynomial ring in some graded setting um and now we try to introduce a tensor, pro a tensor product on modules of B by this rule. So I want X to act as a derivation. I want X on a tensor product of two modules to act on the left plus on the right. This is a very boring rule I can imply, uh, I can impose. But now we have to think what happens if X to the N acts on some tensor? What happens? I mean. Maybe let's let's start easier. <laughs> so what happens? One should put all these things on slides, but never never does. I don't know why. So 
let's act with x on some v q to the i and some w q to the j. So this is in degree q to the i, this is in degree q to the j. It's part of some big module. And here it's part of some big module. We don't care which one. How does x act now on the tensor part? I want to so I want to define maybe the point is to define v tensor w as b module. Well, I mean, how do I act? I mean, how I define it is acts acts on v q to the i and w q to the j is left alone, and then v q to the i is left alone, and x acts on q to the j w q to the j. This is our product rule. I'm trying it like a one-dimensional algebra. It's the most boring thing I can try. This works, and I can I can continue. And now. What happens if x to the n acts on a guy like this? Well, but now, now I start now I start getting problems because, because the braiding I have imposed was x to the ij half. So so if I if I start now to to uh, to take higher and higher powers, I will I will not just get binomial coefficients. But I will get something like this, right? Because, yeah, because because I messed up and I forgot to tell you that, of course, here you have to pass the x past the i, and you get a q to the two i. Ah. So this is now what's different because there's a braiding present, and of course, what I'm now doing depends on the choice of the braiding. So there's a product rule, but there is sort of some braiding appearing here. And now if I compute what is powers of n acting, then I get here, depending on which of the x's goes first, I get here a sum like this. Sum will disappear, and this should be L here. Sorry. Sum will disappear if we set this L exactly to the order of Q square. So which is the order of the, the choice I made at the very beginning. And in this case, everything happens like in positive characteristic. So the sum of this, this cyclotomic sum is again zero, the same as in this first case we have this p binomial coefficient becomes zero, and of course the higher ones also become zero except the last last one. But this works as in characteristic p. So the the take home message at this point is that um, an L derivative in a braided tensor category, and this is in this generality it's true. I mean I'm not stating I'm not overstating it. So an L derivative in a braided tensor category which has a self-braiding of order precisely L is again a derivative. All the middle terms disappear, like in characteristic P. And in that sense, we are allowed to set it zero. So that's why setting X to the L to zero is a lot. It's a, it's an, it's a, it's a, it gives you a well-defined uh, tensor product. And that's what we do. So we get in this way, a very non-trivial, non-semi-simple tensor category. And it's very instructive to compute tensor products. So you can, I mean, this would be one of the exercises I'm very happy to do with you uh, Wednesday. Uh, you know, you have, it's, it's a, I think it's a four-liner. You have maybe maybe Q to the I here and then X and then here Q to the I plus two. And then you have, I don't know, Q to the J and then X here and Q to the J plus two. So these are like two two-dimensional indecomposable representations. And you take the tensor. I mean, you can almost guess what it's going to be, right? It's gonna, it's gonna be, it's gonna be something one-dimensional in Q i plus j. And then it's gonna be something two-dimensional in Q i plus j plus two. And then it's gonna be something one-dimensional in i plus j plus four, and some action of x. Which you have to compute, right? Simply by graded objects. And the graded objects that you get, this is the tensor product in the in the graded vector spaces will give you on this level it's always good to switch these, these different categories so in the category of graded vector spaces that's your tensor product but now there is this x acting here and this x acting here and i have to compute how x is acting here and in fact of course what you get is that there is a one-dimensional simple inside and there is a three-dimensional but they don't have to split there doesn't have to be a direct sum can be a non uh, depend on the cases if it's large enough, if n is large enough, then this product can be a direct sum. So, so this is more or less the, 
very first example we should have in mind for the second talk. So that's how things go. That's why we do what we do. And this, in fact, is a very non-trivial tensor category. And now we have this recipe how to make from tensor products, uh, from tensor categories, braided tensor categories by the center. So we can now take the relative center. So we take the center of rep B over C relative to the braided tensor category C, and this gives us a modular tensor category. And in fact, that's the tensor category of the small quantum group. And note that we have not in any way used or not used whether there is this associator for the even n case or not. It doesn't it simply doesn't matter. I mean, you, you, you build the tensor category piece by piece from what it should be. So you start with a, with a great vector spaces and then some algebra of what's going to be our Borel part and then some drill field center relative to the semi-simple part. And that's a model tensor category, period. And it is a model tensor category independent of whether you start with associator or not. So you can do this also in very many complicated cases, right? I could start with a completely weird tensor category, <laughs> maybe not completely weird, like affine Lie algebra, and I can pick some algebra like this, and I can get a tensor category, and then I can take the relative transfer center. I get some very weird model tensor category. Good question, please. So the uh, the the C embeds into the rep B C as the trivial ones, right? Is that is that right? Exactly. Cool. Thank you. And it works exactly because this category, this algebra looks like nil potent. So, so it has, um, yeah, you have, you have a co-unit here, which, which sort of uh, X can act as zero, and then you embed a uh, simple object. Is this going to be the same as the identical modules over B in, inside the category C? Yes. So, of course, the previous version that you will probably find in several textbooks is you can start with, uh, so it's all Hopf algebra we formulated. That I think makes it much more difficult to access. So you start with a semi-simple Hopf algebra, which we had. You you have a, a what's going to be a Nichols algebra next time. You have an algebra over it. You take a smash product. That's our tensor category here. So that's going to be the smash product tensor category in this language. And then you take the Grinfeld double of this Hopf algebra, and then you by hand divide out relations between the two the, the double semi-simple part. You you glue together the two Cartan parts. And this you shouldn't do, I think, by hand. You should rather do it by using the intrinsic this construction, using the braiding. But you can do this, yes. But then you get the same result, exactly. But I think it's much more work. I think here you will see what happens very, very fast. And um, now let's a little bit look into, so is that root maybe clear how, how these things should go? A stack, like I start with some category and I sort of build, build new things and make them braided and so on. And that's actually what, what gives us the result we want. And let's start look just for fun how the details look like. So because maybe I think this is the, in some sense, the easiest way how to see how UQSL2 looks like. Um, effectively, what happens is the, the half braiding that I want corresponds to a second action of some guy that's dual to X. And it's exactly what happens in the Drinkful double. So I could do more details on that, but I'm not. But... Uh, but this is actually not so. And then the simple objects in this Grinfeld center are essentially the simple objects that we had, the, the, the indecomposables that we had before that are in some sense symmetric. So now I have Q to the minus two, one Q to the two. I cannot have one Q to the two, Q to the four. It has to be somehow symmetric. Um, and that somehow the X acts in one direction and then the X star from the half braiding in the other direction. And that's basically how it looks like. And um, it also has indecomposables because you can have this like here and here, and then you can have some X star can act somehow here and X star can somehow, X can somehow act here with some scalar. And depending on the scalars A and B, you get indecomposables. So this is how the indecomposables look like. And one can also draw how the projectors look like. <laughs> and they look like this. So you have here uh, an, an indecomposable over B, which is now a simple object. And it can here also, and this can continue with X like this, but it can also continue with X star like this. And let's not take the same ones, but let's take different ones. And then here you can continue with X star like this and like this. So somehow you glue together four different arcs and that's sort of the largest indecomposable you can build with the rules I gave you. Somehow it's like all combinations of X and X star up here. So maybe that picture is not so instructive, but that's sort of the... The, the final thing one has to know about this category. If you want to work with it, you have to know how the projectors look like. So can you yeah, again, how did the X star come about? X the, where, where, do, where do we get X star from the, can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah, missed so it comes from, 
So I didn't explain this very well, but um, so this comes from where the half rating comes from. So you oh, want okay. to, so being the differential center means I have a mean of, of commuting with somebody else. So let me write this down. So if I have here, so everything is in C, right? I don't even write C anymore. I have a B module acting on V, I have a B module where B acts, uh, and I have a module where W acts, right? And now I want the braiding. Do I do this? Well, uh, well, I somehow have to say, well, W, oops, yeah. Well, I have to specify, so I want to specify V and a map CV, which tells me how to do this. So in fact, what I have to do is exactly the same as for this uh, for this uh, GG modules that we had at the beginning. So I now need I now need some way how I can lose the B, so I can later act. Then so how how will V V break with W? Well, it will first it will first sorry will first lose a B. Like with the G grade vector spaces. And then you act with this B. So first, like this. And then you act with this on the W. I don't know how to draw this. So B, V, W go to B dot W, B. So, like for the groups before, right? So the element is in degree G, it loses the G and acts on the guy he's passing. And that's here. And now we have to ask what does it mean to, to, to have a map from V to B tensor V? And basically, you can dualize that to have a map from B star tensor V to B. And that's why it's X star. So it's somehow acting with a dual algebra. So there's an action of X and an action of X star in the other direction. Because this tells you how to, it's like G action and G grading. It's exactly the same construction, actually. I see. Thank you. That's why I did this example. So maybe it doesn't, at this point, make too much sense to continue. I think it's good that we slowed a little bit down. I had more in mind, but it's good that I don't. And um, let's just ask, is there more questions on what we did so far? So the idea was, hey, please. It, it's not, my question is just, what would be the best example you can calculate to um, basically get a hand or a grip on those concepts we just learned? What would be a good, simple example to just work out? Maybe because now I, I got what you said, but I think I want to do it on my own. Do you have any recommendation on what so I think example? for the whole story, this is the simplest example. That's why I chose it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, of course, previously, um, steps go much easier. Like, for example, um, no, I really think it's it's quite the simplest example. Are you asking for like a specific N to use? Mm, not necessarily. I don't, I don't think a specific N would make it any easier. Honestly, I think it doesn't get much simpler than that. Okay. <laughs> I have to think, but... No, no, I, th I think I think this is um, so. The last step with the Drinfield center is a little bit complicated. That is easier to understand in this GG case, mm -hmm. right? So that's why where this was on. So you can like repeat several of the steps with this half grading and so on. This I would do in this G uh, G affinite group. This is the case where you do this. Uh, but but uh, but with this extension, which becomes non semi simple, I think this is the simplest example. So so maybe the question with it, which n is the easiest? So. So yes, n equals two is actually quite complicated because you get an associator, right? Um, yeah. So so maybe maybe it's easier to start with n equals three or something, but then really arbitrary n doesn't make so much difference. Does this the structure yeah. make sense if you have an infinite dimensional algebra? B, you mean? Let's be very specific. What's infinite dimensional? So C being infinite is completely no problem, and that is interesting for many applications. So, so C just is the ambient thing in which we work, right? B being infinite dimensional, for example, causes a problem at this step. Yeah, yeah that's what. They so, so uh, you do that. So, for example, yeah. in these cases, and it's the one of course the cases you think about in these cases, which are Nichols algebra, which we'll do next time much more thoroughly. Um, in this case, um, you have a graded a grading. I mean, an n grading, not not g grading, but an n grading, and you can take the graded dual. So, so in that case again, it works. Um, but then you have to be careful what you mean with half braidings. I mean, then somehow they are not really all half braidings, but the ones that are sort of locally finite, or I don't know what to say. I, I'm not sure that this is very so well written. Can, anyway. can make a pairing with the gradual 
For the nickel settlement, you can, for yeah, example. Yeah, I mean, for example. For a period of time, you have the possibilization. So whenever this is a nice enough algebra B that has a suitable definition of a dual, then you can certainly write down what it is, and then you have to ask yourself how much this is still the half braiding, depending on how big the algebra is. Uh, but but yes, uh, do. And also the other thing you can do is you can simply say I will really take all half braidings, but then I maybe cannot write it like this. So, um, but there is like a little bit then the issue of which star do you mean exactly? Yes. Will you explain more next time about this? Like the motivation for why you're constructing the representations of the boundary of the drill point double something associated with morale. You kind of just said this in passing. Yes. So next time, next time the point is to vastly generalize what this B can be. And basically the point is that you can for any B, you can, for example, get all quantum groups. So that's how I think one should construct quantum groups. You start with the Cartan part, then B is the Borel, so it's called like that. B is the sort of the, the, the upper triangular matrices. Um, this is some Nichols algebra in this category, which you get canonically, and you can also classify and so on. And then you, you make it to a moderate tensor category by taking the Drinfeld double. And that's the quantum group. And that's like, I think, a very, very general, I think this is underestimated. That's also why I want to say it, like how general you can do this. I can start with an arbitrary tensor, very tensor category, semi-simple maybe, uh, fix an arbitrary object, compute the Nichols algebra, then I have my modules over this and my Drinfeld center, and this gives you more tensor category. Like in, in it doesn't have to be Hopf algebras. It doesn't have to be. That's why I'm explaining it that. So that is the one thing. And then the other thing is, of course, why we want to do this with respect to physics. But that's maybe a different lecture. But that we will do next next time. Okay. If there are no more questions, let's thanks. Thanks again.